Greetings to all here in Washington and to those watching around the world. My name is Mark Plant. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. And on behalf of my CGD colleagues, as well as our co-sponsors, Development Reimagined and the Finance for Development Lab, I'd like to welcome you to this event on reimagining African agency, utilizing SDRs to achieve African priorities in a post-COVID-19 recovery. We have a distinguished panel of experts to discuss the contours of development finance in Africa in the face of overwhelming challenges brought about by COVID, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the global financial turmoil. Already, after just a day at these meetings, we hear the call for more development, development finance, particularly for Africa. The, the call is loud and clear, but what's less clear is where that development finance will come from. The adage of do more with less isn't going to work, so where will more come from? One hope was and still remains special drawing rights, or SDRs, a reserve asset that's issued by the IMF and held by central banks around the world. While SDRs are not currency, you can't buy anything with an SDR, you can exchange them for dollars, for NIMBY, for yen, for euros, or pounds, to comfort the central bank balance sheet, and the central bank can then provide monetary financing to the government in case of need. It's a powerful instrument, but one that has a limited range of use. In August 2021, the IMF issued $650 billion of new SDRs to countries around the world in proportion to their shareholding or quota at the IMF. That injection of reserve liquidity was hailed by the manager director of the IMF as a shot in the arm for the global economy. But unfortunately, like this financial vaccine, has followed the pattern of the COVID-19 vaccines. Much of it sits unused in advanced countries, while the needs of African countries and other developing countries are great. So is there a way to mobilize these SDRs for the most vulnerable countries, those countries whose vulnerability has only increased since COVID-19, not decreased as we had all hoped? Before we get to the panel, let me review what's been done with SDRs and where we stand on the idea of recycling SDRs, that is using some of the advanced countries' unused SDRs for the benefit of countries in need. Can we start the presentation? Um, well, well, there we go. I have three points to make briefly about the past before I look to the future. The first is that Africa has made the most use of its SDRs since August 2021. As SDRs are fungible with other reserves, one really needs to look at countries' total reserve assets and, to un and movements to understand how the SDRs can and were used. But as a first approximation, one can look at what countries have done with their SDR holdings since August 2020. And you can see from this map, the colors, the, the countries in darker colors, in the yellows and browns, are those that have depleted their SDRs relative to where they were at the time of the SDR allocation. Those in uh, bright green teal are those countries that have accumulated SDRs. So even after that initial big SDR allocation, what you've seen is most African countries have drawn down their holdings of SDRs below what they were in August 2021. And in fact, some of these SDR holdings are made artificially, not artificially high, but are higher than we'd otherwise expect because the countries have gotten loans from the IMF. If you take those loans out, the, the African continent, if you will, looks even uh, in darker shades. That is, the SDR depletion is even greater. So basically, SDRs never disappear. When you cash in an SDR, some other country gets it. But what you see is there's an SDR flow out of Africa into the rest of the world. And that pretty clearly indicates Africa has a need for finance that continues to this day. The Africans are actively using their SDRs to finance uh, their activities, their governmental activities, as they face this difficult, difficult economic time. So Africa has, been, has made good use of the SDRs. Whereas in other countries, the advanced countries in particular, they have other ways of dealing with their financial deficits and have not used the SDRs. My second point is that recycling efforts to date have focused on the IMF's Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust and Resilience and Sustainability Trust. In November 2021, after the big SDR allocation, the G20 recognized this need to recycle SDRs and pledged to recycle 100 billion SDRs from the advanced countries to vulnerable countries. 
Of that, about 16 billion has been pledged to the IMF's PRGT, Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, and about 40 billion to the IMF's Resilience and Sustainability Trust. Now, the IMF was very active in emergency lending right after COVID. And this chart on the left-hand side is the three months of lending from the IMF after COVID. Yellow is the, um, is the actual lending. The small blue bar is the repayments that had to take place. The large blue bar is the net lending. And you can see PRG dis disbursements in the first three months after COVID were extremely large and remain large through 2021 and have diminished ever since. So the IMF made a big effort a big push at, at, at the beginning to get emergency money out the door. Now they're converting that emergency money into longer term loan and the pace is much slower. But what this shows is you still need, African countries are still relying on this very important source of financing for their country. The other facility, the RST, has been launched with five pilot countries, only one of which is Africa, Rwanda. Uh, a sixth country is about to go to the board uh, the Seychelles, uh, but the RST is focused on a longer-term problem, how you build resiliency, and the IMF has been very careful in getting money out the door, getting these programs well-crafted, so they have a solid basis for uh, longer-term balance of payments lending. But it's important to note, even though these first five countries have been approved by the IMF for the program, not one SDR has left the IMF coffers yet. No disbursement has been made under the RST. And so the process is moving very, very slowly. Now, I said at the beginning, or at the beginning of this slide, that about $16 billion has gone, is going to the PRGT, $40 billion to the IMF's Resilience and Sustainability Trust. There was a promise of $100 million. That leaves you with about $44 billion, or sorry, $100 billion. That leaves you with $44 billion wondering where it's going to go. There's no clear uh, place for it to go. And so countries of the world are struggling about how you use this remaining uh, amount, how you're going to recycle the remaining, amo remaining amount. And this brings me to my third point. The best uh, proposal on the table is a proposal from the African Development Bank to use SDRs as hybrid capital in order to increase their lending. So the idea is that central banks of the world would lend a small portion of their SDRs to the AFDB. The AFDB would take that pool of SDRs, use it as hybrid capital, leverage off that capital, and increase its loan pool. Why is this such a good idea? Uh, there are five reasons. First of all, the AFDB can leverage. So for every SDR that's loaned to the, uh, the African Development Bank, African Development Bank increases its lending by two to four times that amount. So it expands the lending power of the SDRs. The second thing that's important, particularly for central bankers, is the SDRs are not spent. They sit on the books of the AFDB as capital, and what's spent is the leverage funds. The, the SDRs are never enter into the world market. Why is this important for the central banks? Well, when you, when you take an SDR and you convert it to uh, dollars or euros, some central bank has to provide that dollar or euro. And central banks don't particularly like people pulling their reserves away from them, even if they're exchanging them for SDRs. So the fact that the SDRs remain as a basis for lending but are not themselves lent is a big asset to this program, and there's no call on central bank reserves. This preserves something called the reserve asset characteristic of the SDR. The SDR can still be counted on the central bank's balance sheet as a reserve asset, which is important for their balance sheet management and for the management of reserves around the world. Plus, the African Development Bank has designed this uh, proposal so there's some positive net remuneration that the, uh, the, the central banks who lend the SDRs to uh, the African Development Bank will get a positive return on their loan. And so that's good for their balance sheet. This is the, the best uh, proposal on the table. It's actionable. It's actionable right now. But right now, it lacks political momentum. And let me talk about what I see as the next steps to move the conversation on SDRs along. We need to find five countries to donate or to loan their SDRs to the African Development Bank. For risk of management reasons, you need five countries. So far, there's only one country that's indicated positively that they're inclined to do so, and that's the United Kingdom. Other countries are thinking about it, but there needs to be some political momentum to move this forward. Secondly, 
The RST, this Resilience and Sustainability Trust, needs the support and attention of this community, of the world community, to make sure the IMF is doing these programs well and getting money out the door. And the Poverty Reduction Growth Trust uh, needs a certain kind of subsidy resources in, you know, in order to keep it lending. So these are steps that could be confronted at these meetings this week, but certainly it's something for, it's the agenda for the next few months, if you will, on SDRs. All these proposals are in place, they just need to be moved forward. It takes political commitment, it takes a commitment of financial resources, and that commitment seems to be lacking at this point. Longer term steps, you can expand this idea of hybrid capital beyond the African Development Bank to other development banks, to other institutions that are prescribed holders of SDRs. Uh, people are talking about it, people are considering the possibilities. There's also the possibility to explore other recycling options. Uh, there's a proposal out there for an SDR bond to be issued by the World Bank or other development banks, a slightly different type of financial en engineering. And many of people have seen uh, have put forward proposals to use SDRs to capitalize special funds for climate or for, say, pandemics. That's a more complicated proposal, but it bears further discussion. There are advocates out there who say that $650 billion that was let out in 2021 isn't enough, so we should have another SDR allocation. It's a long, complicated process to do, it, to do that, but it's, again, a discussion worth having over the next six months to a year. And finally, there's some people who are the cognoscenti, if you will, have proposed some very fundamental reforms of the SDR to make it a more manageable in instrument. What we've learned in the last six months or year is that the SDR is a clumsy instrument the way it's now structured, difficult to get f out of the advanced country uh, central banks into the developing country central banks. So just to reiterate my three points, Africa's been the big user of SDRs and has shown that SDRs are a useful tool for managing liquidity, for getting through the crisis. They need more. Recycling efforts have been focused on the IMFs, PRGT and RST, and really we now need to look to the African Development Bank to be the pioneer in getting this hybrid capital up and going. So those are my initial remarks to start the discussion. I hope it provides a good basis. I'll leave you then to our panel. I think it's Hannah who uh, will introduce them. Thank you very much. Let's go. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for that brilliant uh, explanation of where we are right now uh, with special drawing rights and uh, the African continent, uh, and also some really helpful next steps, which I'm hoping that our also excellent panel uh, will be able to help us understand even more. Um, but before I begin, let me do some introductions. I'm Hannah Ryder, um, the CEO of Development Reimagined, and we're really happy to be partnering with the Center for Global Development, our friends, and also uh, Finance for Development Lab, uh, also based in Paris, uh, for this event. So um, thank you uh, to our friends and partners at uh, CGD and FDL for that. Uh, I have uh, with me uh, a fantastic panel. Um, I'm going to begin to introduce uh, one of our panelists who's joining us uh, online first, and you know I will begin with women first. Um, Mavis Ousu-Gyanfi will be joining us online. She's the Executive Vice President of the Africa Center for Economic Transformation. Brilliant, brilliant think tank uh, based in Ghana and looking forward to hearing her insights. Uh, on my immediate left, I have Hanan Morsi, the Deputy Executive Secretary and Chief uh, Economist at the United, Economic, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA one of the few female chief economists around and really happy um, that, that you were in that role um, and directing uh, ECA uh, on this work. Uh, next, I have Jason Braganza, who is the executive director at African Forum and Network on Debt and Development, otherwise known as Afrodad, uh, and joins us from, it's based in Harare, right? And, but you're yeah. often mostly in Nairobi. In Nairobi. Um, and, and really looking forward to your insights on that, bringing, us, bringing to us the civil society perspective 
as well on all of these issues and questions. And last but not least, I like to call him the Honourable uh, Jude Moore, <laughs> a Senior Policy <laughs> Fellow at the Centre for Global Development, again, one of our great friends here, and former Minister of Public Works uh, for Liberia. So thank you, all of you, for joining us and looking forward to, to what you will share with us, um, your insights today on this question of how can we reimagine African agency with regards to special drawing rights. Now, of course, we can reimagine African agency in lots of different ways, but today we're going to be talking specifically about special drawing rights. So, Judy, I'm going to start with you, um, since, it's, since, since you are friends here at the Centre for Global Development. Um, look, we have the statistic uh, that African countries, we've calculated at Development Reimagine that African governments in total spent 130 billion US dollars to address the COVID-19 crisis, both in terms of economic and health spending. But in terms of the special drawing rights, out of a 650 billion allocation globally, they got 33 billion. So before the new allocation of special drawing rights, and before we really understood that it was just 33 billion. What did you think of the pros and cons of the this kind of mechanism for addressing the COVID-19 crisis? Um, Mark was also telling us about how PRGT was deployed fairly quickly. Was, did you think SDRs were a potential helpful uh, idea or not really? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. I, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and, and I, I think, you know, so the United States, for example, let's just take the U.S. for example, which of course doesn't need the SDR. Um, in its response to COVID, um, supporting lives and livelihoods, the U.S. spent at least $5 trillion for this economy alone. So obviously we were doing $650 billion for the entire world when one country in the world was spending up to $5 trillion. Um, not many African countries, I don't think there was any African country that could actually spend that amount of money. I think it's also important to understand that in a decade leading up to COVID, African countries ha had spent a significant amount of money spending on, on infrastructure and other things. And so it meant that their balance sheets were pretty exposed, especially when it came to servicing that debt. So by the time the crisis happens, um, th there's not much resilience left in the ability, the fiscal space to be able to address that. Now they did everything they could. So having an external source of resources that allows them to respond to that was absolutely necessary. But there were always questions up front about the adequacy of 650 billion, knowing how it would be broken down. I mean, obviously we're going to talk about the reform at one point, but that in the formation of these organizations, say with the UN, it was one country, one vote, but with the IMF and the World Bank, it was a reflection of the size of the economy. Mm -hmm. It's important to understand in 1945, most of the African countries that exist as countries today did not exist in that form. They were colonies. And so in terms of voice of how this apportionment will happen, it's not as if you know we had a vote in that. Mm -hmm. And so knowing upfront what the allocation would be, it was always clear that what we accrue to African economies would not be enough. So then started this conversation about onward lending to countries, especially for a country that spent $5 trillion. Obviously, it didn't need the SDRs. Would it then be able to onward lend it? Initially, at least from the G20 uh, announcement of, of, of $80 billion, $21 billion of that was supposed to be from the United States. So understanding that African economies were not going to get as much as they needed, but that there was a possibility of onward lending meant that maybe SDRs could actually help to do it. But obviously now with the United States, they couldn't get the political will to do that. And with um, the composition of the current Congress, I'm not confident <laughs> that we're going to get 20, 21 billion from the United States. So yes, it was a great idea, but up front it was flawed, basically mm. because the allocation method is, is, reflects power and it doesn't reflect need. Yep. So let's come back to that question about what next. But I also want to explore, and Mavis, you've joined us online, um, I also want to explore this point about how African countries have actually used the special drawing rights, um, that the 33 billion that they did get. And again, Mark was showing us, and we also, also ourselves have been doing some analysis on the take-up rate of special drawing rights. And it's clear that the African region 
has used has been the region using SDRs the most. Um, Mavis, what would you say are Africa's priorities and use of special drawing rights? Have governments been using the special drawing rights well? Um, and what sectors would you have expected to see um, the expenditure on? Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, and it's great to be on the panel with colleagues. I'm very sorry that I can't be in the room physically with all of you um, today. I think, as Guide rightly pointed out, when the crisis hit, um, countries did not have a lot of fiscal space anyway to begin with, um, and they need they urgently needed sources of finance. So we we saw SDRs being used for debt repayment. We saw saw money being used for, um, you know, security safety nets um, for poor people. We saw some of the money also being used for um, small and medium enterprises to try and help small and medium enterprises, um, you know, basically navigate the period where we had to close down um, movement of people for the health and safety um, of the continent. Now, depending on who you talk to, civil society, there are lots of questions around the transparency of the money, um, the extent to which it has been effectively reported against, um, etc. But just let's talk about if we put aside the 10 percent that we lost and let's remember that it wasn't just africa that had you know we saw inefficient expenses happening um in africa it happened in a lot of other countries as they navigated this crisis generally a lot of the money was used for things that the continent urgently needed yes we should do a much better job of reporting on how the money was spent accountability etc i think for me the issue that really concerned me was whilst there was rightly a focus on short-term issues around you know how do we use them you know how do we um plug the liquidity, liquidity gap that we urgently have. There wasn't enough thought going into the long-term needs of the continent. And we are in a slightly difficult position where a lot of effort is, is being placed on short-term prices and insufficiently on laying the foundations for long-term structural reform so that we do have the breathing space and we do have the capacity to respond much better and be more resilient um, in, in future years um, towards any crisis that we might encounter. Right. And I'm sure, Jason, you also have some thoughts in terms of the accountability and so on. And, and it would be great to also hear from, from your perspective on that. But let me also add a further question um, for you to, to, to help us with. Because, again, there was also within the African continent a fairly... Jude was talking about the global in unequal allocation to African countries. But there was also within the continent... Uh, some countries got very little, uh, others got more, depending on their economic size. Uh, the top 10 African countries uh, with the largest SDR allocations accounted for just over 62% of all the, of the full allocation to the continent. So there is that issue as well. And, and those are not necessarily the countries, therefore, that need uh, SDRs even to plug the liquidity crap, and then as well as... as if SDRs were to be used for longer term questions, I think that is a question. And I think Mark also raised some interesting points about that. Um, but do you think there is, what do you think the options are for dealing with that inequity? And do you think, for example, these ideas about rechanneling um, special drawing rights are the right kinds of ideas? Would they be able to address those inequities? Yeah, um, thanks, Hannah, and uh, thanks for, for having um, Afrodad on the panel. I think let, let's start with the foundation that both Jude and, and Mavis have, have put before us. Um, a con historically, very unequal way of, of doing work in terms of how SDRs are, 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 are allocated uh, as, as a mechanism for dealing with a liquidity crisis, but then also a very severe uh, 
constrained uh, fiscal and monetary space um, that many African countries uh, were experiencing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, added to that was, you know, the inability, uh, you know, in, in the decade or decade and a half uh, leading to COVID-19 for any sort of meaningful structural transformation agenda to actually take place on the continent and therefore create any sort of uh, economic and financial buffer in, in terms of dealing with the crisis. And so when you put these different um, aspects together, you, you start to understand and, and observe why um, the special drawing rights then you know, play a very different role um, and, and a very important role in, in, in times of, of crisis. Um, with regard to rechanneling, I think the important thing to, for us to consider is you know, what is the mechanism? You know, if, if, if the allocation uh, is based on voting shares or, or size of economy, then we're going to continue seeing uh, the same um, inequalities uh, continue in, in the rechanneling exercise. I think the other risks that we are likely to observe is the kind of uh, policy further policy constraint in terms of policy space that recipient countries are likely to get uh, or, or to be imposed on um, in terms of trying to access the, the rechanneled SDRs through some of the instruments that, that Mark has talked about in his presentation. So, it's, it's a very complicated uh, set of equations when, when trying to figure out how a, a historically um, uneven and unequal system where we were not part of how that mechanism was established, plus a binding constraint on the, on the policy space versus the inability to transform in a period when the continent uh, was integrating very significantly into global economy, but not really transforming itself into uh, rep in terms of revenue generation. So that complexity makes rechanneling also very difficult um, in, 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 in how we're going to uh, see you know, countries in the continent see that. Mm, yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess that's also one of the benefits of the special drawing rights. In any case, Mavis was talking about the different sectors that have been able to be used. That's only because it, it is an unconditional instrument, right? Uh, even though it is central banks have to use it as reserves, and so on, they are, they don't have any policy reforms that have to be delivered with them. So I guess that's, that's part of, that's part of the benefit, but the rechanneling, of course, then could potentially create, uh, create problems in that, in that way, delaying processes. And it also is a national decision fundamentally for countries that do want to rechannel. So we've seen um, a number of a number of uh, central banks also say that they, they can't uh, rechannel, um, notably yeah, ECB. ECB, yes, exactly. Um, but then, but others also at the same time working very hard to think about different options for rechanneling. And, um, and Mark was talking about one of them, some of them, but we have had commitments, for example, from China um, to reallocate 10 billion special drawing rights specifically to the African continent. France also uh, made that kind of commitment as well to the African continent. Um, but we have not really seen those deployed necessarily. And so, Hanan, I want to come to you in terms of what are the, what are the African views on how these, or, or on these, uh, these instruments, on the potential deployment of reallocated uh, SDRs? What are the options out there? Is the A AFDB... Uh, Mark talked about the AFDB hybrid capital instrument. The UNECA has been working on uh, one as well. What are the pros and cons of this? How do we bring African institutions uh, into the picture as well, from your perspective? Thank you very much. I, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I think the special drawing rights um, are a very important and unique uh, instrument that the IMF has to basically uh, support global stability. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there to serve to support reserves and to meet global liquidity needs. Uh, in the design of the SDRs, according to articles of agreement, it's supposed to be that the IMF assesses every five-year period whether there is actually long-term global liquidity need to actually you know, issue or withdraw SDRs. Okay? In uh, 12 periods that has happened since the establishment of that system, there's only four times that this has happened. 
And part of it is the fact that the process tend to be quite political. So part of the issue is actually ensuring that it's more analytical and evidence-based in terms of the decisions. Second, there is also another reason under which the IMF can consider, which is you know, for unexpected developments. And this is how the 650 billion US dollars that were issued were actually in view of the pandemic, which was very useful. But then, so you have the issue of at the decision point, how it's decided, whether it's evidence-based. I mean, when you have central banks deciding, it's based on evidence and what is needed. Mm -hmm. So if you have the, the IMF making a global decision on liquidity, it needs to be evidence-based and less uh, political. So that's one. Uh, two, uh, for the uh, uh, incidents where you have a unexpected development, there need to be some sort of automatic stabilizers. Not that every time this has to go to the board. There are certain things under which we can design. It can be an oper a way like an operationalization paper that goes to the board of the IMF that basically sets the framework on how this is triggered. Mm -hmm. um, it can be, for example, when the world is going through a global recession, as we all define it as economists, two quarters of you know, uh, cyclical recession, then you know, automatically trigger that. It can be when you have force majeure events, mm -hmm. a pandemic, a global crisis, uh, and it can also be when there is like, you know, um, huge capital reversals from, you know, emerging and developing markets that really presses on, you know, uh, their liquidity needs and, you know, puts them at, uh, you know, risk in terms of meeting liquidity needs and so on. So these are some of the things that can be done to improve how the system actually of the allocation mm -hmm. operates. But mm -hmm. then you have the second stage of it, when it actually happens, when it actually the decision is taken to issue these SDRs, uh, the way that they are allocated currently uh, is based on the quota at the IMF, mm -hmm. uh, which really is based more or less on the size of the economy uh, and basically that means that, uh, you know, larger countries, uh, mm. you know, more open, basically get more. And many of these don't actually need that liquidity. So mm. uh, a way to reform that system is to actually meet the spirit of the Articles of Agreement. So this is targeted to meet liquidity mm -hmm. needs. So in addition to the quota, there should be something accordingly that takes into account liquidity needs across countries so that you're actually tackling the problem, yes. not creating uh, you know, an additional layer of complexity. Yeah. Uh, so that's in terms of you know, the system and the allocation itself. But also, definitely, I mean, another issue, and this is about voice of African, and you know, agency and voice of African countries, uh, it cannot be that in the system, I mean, first of all, you have 10 countries that uh, you know, represent 55% of quota at the IMF. I think there is something, you know, fundamentally unjust about this in terms of, you know, the, the, the way voice of African countries are represented. Uh, you have 54 countries um, with a population of 1.4 billion that has uh, less quota than Germany with 83 million. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we need to really uh, reform that system to reduce, you know, the share of, for example, openness and reserves, in include something about exposure and vulnerability to actually allow, uh, you know, developing and emerging markets to have a larger share and voice. Because also a very important issue is, while they have this limited voice, the operating, uh, uh, you know, uh, cost at the, of the IMF comes from loans that these countries are the ones that are paying. Mm. So I think something has to give. It's either, you know, the large shareholders need to chip in into this or these countries that are actually being the biggest clients and the ones that are supporting the operating cost of the institution need to have a higher voice. So I think this is an issue that, you know, has to be tackled. Reform, uh, uh, you know, quota reforms are already starting the cycle for it, starting this year. Uh, 
So voice and advocacy for this is key to look into this, to raise the flag that you know, we need to change that system. But then uh, that's like you know, one issue. But then we go to the channeling, uh, rechanneling uh, uh, part. And here, this is really complicated by a number of issues. One is the requirement of the uh, you know, reserve quality. Mm. Uh, uh, characteristics, reserve yes. asset quality. Uh, and, um, you know, this really, uh, one, is a bit uh, outdated relative to practices currently by number of central banks. So it, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a bit like kind of very conservative, uh, has not been revised. And then also it's kind of inconsistent with the fact that for uh, uh, SDRs, their use is supposed to be unconditional. Mm. So there is something inherent about that I think we that need to be looked into. Mm. But then also the, the way it operates. So currently, um, uh, you know, you, for, for this to happen, even if the IMF decides that uh, a certain use uh, meets the reserve asset quality, which is exactly what happened in the case, internally in the case of the African Development Bank proposal, yes. The decision still remains at a national level for the different entities. Yeah. So uh, that complicates the process, and that's why a lot of the you know pledges and commitments that were made uh, had a lot of difficulty of implementation. Mm. Um, you know, whether I mean France, U.S., many number of countries that have at the top perhaps led, like made commitments or pledged, yeah. but then the decision making in each of the countries. In the US, it has to go to Congress. In you know, uh, Euro Eurozone area, it has to go to ECB. This really complicates tremendously the process mm -hmm. in terms of then the implementation. So I think one area that we need to perhaps go back, step back and rethink is, can this be internalized? Meaning, if the IMF is uh, a bank of SDRs, when you deposit your money at a, at a bank, you have a claim to these deposits, but you don't dictate how this is actually managed within the bank and who they lend to. So That's is true. there a way to simplify the process to actually limit this, I mean, maintain the claims to these SDRs, but actually allow actually, you know, this to function in the way, you know, it was intended to, to be designed. So I think yeah. these are the type of things that we really need to, um, look into, and I think uh, for the uh, uh, African Development Bank proposal, it's a great way through which actually we can get fast results. We can get like leverage three to four times of that money, mm -hmm. um, uh, but we need the support of a number of countries. And that's why, for example, having the discussion with ECB and other entities to, you know, go through how we can make that happen, what are the things, the characteristics and the changes and so on, yeah. will be very important because we don't have that luxury of time yes. with all what's happening in the continent to be derailing this for so long. Yeah. Um, and unless we change the system, even if we have additional SDRs, we're still faced with very similar problems that we're talking about now. Right, right. So I'm really glad that you've brought up some 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 real reimagining of the of the overall um, SDR system, um, as well as the, as well as these issues around the practicalities and also kind of opening up some of the questions, and that prompts me as well just to remind everyone: please get your questions ready. Uh, those of you who are watching online and also here uh, in the room, please get your questions ready for our panelists as well, um, because we will have time um, for you to for our panelists to take your questions, your reflections as well um, as as our audience. Um, but but let me also take the take the moderator's prerogative to keep to keep on for a little bit longer. And let me also remind our panelists. You can also come in and, and ask each other as well. I, please, let's, let's also make this a dynamic discussion. So I think um, in, terms of, in terms of next steps, I mean, there are obviously plenty of, you know, there's a kind of a short-term question. And again, Mark did this really well, I thought. The short-term questions, short-term, how do we get these things done? And there's also this longer term, where are we going to go? And how should we be thinking about special drawing rights in future? Um, 
if you, if if any, if either of you, all of you, um, were to be advising, and and you are often advising African governments and also civil society and others, if you're in terms of your advice on what they, what African governments should be saying, for example, to G20 members such as China, for instance, or the US, we're here in Washington, on the special drawing rights, given the kind of the existing um, systems of control, um, what would be your key suggestions? And I think it's a really nice way to kind of think of it as short term and long term. And let's have Mavis go first. Are you ready, Mavis? Yes, um, thanks, Hannah. <laughs> so I think, um, the thing that most of these countries will be thinking through right now is um, what are we going to achieve um, with, um, you know, uh, reallocating our special drawing rights? So really important that countries are well positioned to answer that question. And, and for me, there are three things that I would encourage ministers to highlight. The first one is in the absence of, you know, some kind of new DSSI, we will still need to find that fiscal space, which means that there'll be some of the money earmarked for repayment and also creating a longer term safety net um, for us to grow and invest, especially given the, you know, very, very high cost of borrowing that countries are currently facing. Secondly, they should explain that they will invest it in reclaiming losses in human capital. And I know this is something that is really of interest to an number of the countries that are going to make these decisions, um, but also to their civil society organizations that will be advocating for this. So reclaiming the losses around education, nutrition, um, maternal mortality, etc. And third is really investing in economic transformation. You know, th there's been a lot of discussions around economic transformation in Africa in the last couple of days at the bank meeting. And I think until until we really think through how we invest in transforming our economy, how we build resilience, how we better withstand future shocks, um, countries will just feel like this is an ongoing vicious cycle or virtuous cycle. Um, I think they will, you know, and, and we need to really be careful in terms of reassuring countries on what we are going to invest in. And for me, this is where channeling the SDR through the African Development Bank becomes really exciting because it's not just about how they then on lend and also the fact that they could triple or quadruple the money. It's also the flexibility they have in talking to countries. So, you know, how do they help countries work together to help us shift from our heavy dependence on um, natural resources or semi-processed natural resources? How do we get us to think beyond national infrastructure, especially transport, energy, and digital access, to really think about infrastructure across borders at the sub-regional and regional level, really to ensure we are connected and we can take advantage of becoming a single market? And how do we invest in our industrialization as a continent? And, and this should not be just every country thinking for themselves, but really helping us think out of the box. So, for example, you know, it's not just about, you know, countries in East Africa being garment manufacturers, you know, the bank, the African Development Bank can just think around how do we build a real garment industry in sub-Saharan Africa? Let's think about how we invest in cotton production in the Sahel. Let's think about how we invest in, um, you know, fabric production in West Africa. Let's think about how that then builds on garment production in East Africa. And how do we export that and take advantage of, um, climate, uh, you know, take advantage of um, climate financing in that process. Um, you know, there, there are so many ways of thinking about it. Why are we thinking about cobalt leaving DRC 
to go elsewhere for phone production. Why are we not thinking about an investment in the smartphone industry in, Ni in Nigeria, which is pretty advanced? Why are we not looking that way towards our industrial development? Mm -hmm. And then it's about spending some of the money to build the key domestic institutions that we need to really drive this economic transformation um, transformation agenda. And also looking at climate adaptation as part of that economic transformation agenda. So we are pushing that the international community should invest in adaptation in Africa as the climate impacts were not created by us. And the SDR is one instrument. So how do we do that? But let's think about it as part of our broader economic transformation agenda. And of course, whatever we do in this space, gender equity should underpin it all. Otherwise, we are only working for half of the continent. Mm -hmm. And by doing this and really <clears throat> investing in economic transformation, we can ensure that we are much, much better positioned to withstand future shocks, which right. means rest of the world, we are less likely to come back to you for more handouts. Um, nice. Our young people <laughs> are more likely to stay on the continent because we've created jobs for them and not crossing... Um, you know, risky seas to find alternative jobs. So if I'm getting you correctly, Mavis, you're saying that the use of the SDRs, your advice would be for countries to invest in putting SDRs into, for instance, AFDB or, or other um, ways of uh, other organisations or countries directly themselves, bilateral transfers even, that that will use them for economic transformation, not because SDRs are only potentially for immediate stabilization, mm -hmm. but because they could also be used for long-term stabilization. And that, and the African continent is crucial to long-term global stabilization. Is that right, Mavis? That's, That's right. Argument? I think okay. that the focus on just looking at the SDR for short solutions is not sufficient for Africa. Okay. So I identified, you know, one short term issue that we could look at. Yeah. But laying the foundation for long term stabilization is critical. And right. we can't just keep thinking about short term stabilization. Okay, great. Other panelists, what are your views? I think I'm going to stick with the short term. Um, I, because I feel like, you know, we have enough people thinking about the long term. And, That's fine. And so when I think about the short term, I'm thinking about the debt issue. There are about, I think, 22 or 23 African sovereigns that are close to debt distress based on the numbers we have today. And for African countries that are in the lower tier of sovereign ratings, they are, they have no access to capital markets. I, I was just talking to Hannah and coming here and said that Turkey earlier this week issued a bond at 9.5% US dollars. And Turkey is ranked higher than most African sovereigns. Mm -hmm. So why would I give up 10% on Turkish bonds when I can earn that and buy African bonds? So for lower tiered African countries, I mean ranked lower, um, they, they have no access. The problem is without access to capital markets, it means that when their bullet payment comes sometime between now and the end of 2024, most of them are not going to be able to meet that, and we might see other defaults. So can we use SDR as a bridge mm -hmm. that allows them to be able to make that transition? I, I think in, in, in the coming 18 months, mm -hmm. we ought to think about how we can use that to stabilize uh, um, uh, African economies on the question of debt. I also think, you know, the issue of voice that Hannah raised uh, is going to take us a bit to be able to build that voice. Mm -hmm. So what can we do now? Yesterday, we had four finance ministers here, all brilliant. Four African finance ministers. Four African finance ministers, all brilliant, really smart people. And each of them made really important points. But it was clear from anyone sitting in the audience that they were not all speaking for a single African objective. The way to amplify voice is to be collective in the things that we ask for. Obviously, Ghana is going to be seeking something different from Angola, but 
it is possible that we hear the exact same thing from the Ghanaian um, finance minister that we hear from the Angolan finance minister. That way, we can pull our voices and be able to give them more oomph in the international system, especially as we engage, even as we think of ways to be able to raise our voices. So one is, how can we leverage SDR for this financing winter that African sovereigns are going through? And secondly, how can African finance ministers, central bank governors, economic planning ministers, do coordination among themselves before coming to um, functions like this so that there is a single objective of the things that the continent wants for itself, and that is being resonated, um, uh, repeated across uh, different peoples uh, saying the exact same thing. So. Right. So, and again, let me just double check what you're Please. saying. <laughs> yes. your, your specific proposal is, one, do that coordination. And we have also talked about this previously at CGD and, and DR joint events around borrower coordination on a whole range of issues, not just SDRs, but definitely this is one where that would be obviously very helpful. Um, but also, in, I mean, we have seen, you're also saying, create that opportunity for African governments to be able to use SDRs for debt repayment. Um, and we've seen them do that, yeah. right? But if, they're, if governments are having to go through PGRT, RST, that's clearly not going to be plausible Absolutely. because I don't think anyone will get uh, a proposal through uh, the board for using. So, so I, that is, a, again, a real question as to how can the mechanism of SDRs actually be created in a useful, mm. in a useful way, deployed in a useful way, and the reallocation deployed in a useful way. Even going through AFDB, I don't think they'd be able to use those for, um, for debt repayments, although, of course, if governments... Money is fungible, right? So if governments do get extra money, they can use it elsewhere. Now, Jason Hannan, what are your thoughts? What's your, your what's your advice? And I know also UNECA also does coordinate does do coordination for African finance ministers um, regularly. You support that process. What what's your advice on SDRs, Hannan, and then Jason? Thank you. So um, I think many a uh, number of the things that you know I've mentioned have actually been echoed in the Conference of Ministers, for example, having SDRs being allocated more on um, you know evidence based mm -hmm. and analytical is one of the asks. Um, you know, having uh, quota reforms and higher voice of African countries at the IMF is already one of the asks and it's reflected both in the communique for our uh, you know, last conference of ministers that mm -hmm. happened last month, as well as in resolutions, including a resolution on global financial architecture reform and what is needed. We'll be happy to share that. So uh, really reflect, like basically acting on these things mm -hmm. uh, would be key. Uh, and I think if there are things that, you know, we need to emphasize, I would say uh, for countries to meet their commitments and pledges that they have made, Yes. We need to make sure Definitely. that the PRGT and RST are sufficiently funded. Uh, to uh, in the current environment, uh, with the you know uh, very high uh, you know uh, uh, rate of uh, interest and um, you know increasingly difficult uh, um, difficulty in um, securing the financing. Uh, what is really needed is more concessional, availability of concessional financing. And this is where the MDB's role mm -hmm. is key. And that's why it's really, uh, it would be really important and useful to channel these SDRs more to MDBs so that we can get that uh, to reduce the cost, yeah. avail the, the, the liquidity needed. Uh, and these institutions can also offer not only lower uh, cost of financing, but longer maturities. And that's what we want to see yeah. so that actually um, African countries can have the time frames and conditions to allow them to pursue development uh, yes. goals and investments. Yeah. So that would be really important. But another area that I think SDRs can help in uh, are uh, things related to um, guarantees, you know, um, you know, and de-risking which would be key uh, for many countries, including middle income countries. Now it's very difficult for them to refinance, roll over, uh, and uh, having, you know, um, actually some sort of guarantees can be, for example, to support uh, 
uh, debt for nature swaps, debt for climate swaps, uh, perhaps uh, you know, debt for hunger swaps, okay, can be the type of things that can really help with very well defined uh, key performance indicators. Yeah. This can be the type of things that would really matter because when, when you have guarantees, you can act, you know, replace whatever existing debt at lower cost, and then you can use that policy space to do a lot of the much needed stuff, whether it's in climate, food security, yeah. or SDGs. Yeah. And that, that, again, brings us to a point that Mark was also talking about with the other kinds of new options and uh, new types of bonds, swaps, um, and Brady bond type proposals exactly. that are also on the table as well. Um, so yes, these, these should also be on the table. Jason, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I was eagerly waiting to hear when the word de-risking was going to come up in this conversation, <laughs> and it finally has. But so um, like your bingo. <laughs> bingo for every um, Washington DC But event. I mean, I think um, I think if you know, uh, in the medium to long term, um, my advice to any African finance minister is that the SDRs aren't going to help, um, and 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 I you know I don't personally see how how they can contribute to any major structural transformation in the economy or on the continent within the current setup of the global financial architecture and the global mm -hmm. economic architecture. Um, our inability or the inability of the global architecture to get um, African countries up the value chain or up the supply chain um, uh, you know, is, is very apparent and therefore trying to isolate uh, SDRs as this magic bullet or silver bullet to, to the transformation challenges that the continent faces I think is I think is somewhat misleading, and therefore, you know, in the medium to long term, I would advise any finance minister not to think of it in that way, um, and therefore think about more fundamental structural changes to the to the global to how global economic governance and the global economic architecture is structured. Um, I think in the short term, I do agree that there are uh, unique opportunities that the special drawing rights do offer in terms of um, creating the fiscal space uh, mm -hmm. for for African countries to then. Um, redirect other resources to, to dealing with um, developmental challenges, uh, dealing with the provision of public services and, and social protection. And therefore, if they were to go into a meeting and into a negotiation, it is then to ask for more mm. um, um, and, and significantly more. I think UNCTAD in 2021 estimated was around three trillion, right? Uh, that was the figure that was being banded around um, in the early days of the, of the pandemic. Um, is to insist on that kind of issuance, where that there is a real, there is likely to be a real impact in what, uh, even based on current voting shares, would look like. Three trillion versus six hundred and fifty billion is likely to have a bit more of an impact on the continent, um, and that any uh, increased allocation or further allocation of SDR should be additional to any other forms of financial support that is being provided to to the African continent. It should not be considered as any other way of sort of um, trading off things like ODA or debt relief and, and, and right. things like that. So sure. I think for me, those are the two uh, two two bits of advice uh, that I would be giving any finance minister if I had the opportunity to speak yeah. to them today. Because yeah. uh, we, we are in a moment where the system, uh, unless it is fundamentally changed, um, cannot uh, allow the continent to move uh, right. from, from the predicament that it finds yeah. itself in. And arguably, there's, I mean, there's always a kind of where there's a will, there's a way, right? And we have seen will and way with for for certain um, issues that have arisen recently um, globally. There may even be a possibility for SDR allocation for the African continent. I mean, maybe that could be something that finance ministers might talk about. Okay, time for audience questions. Um, let's have one question or two questions here in this room and then also online. I'm sure there's a few questions which have come up. Um, so please uh, do introduce yourself. Uh, hands up, please, as well. Um, please introduce yourselves and, um, and ask your question. Please also let us know who, would you, who you'd like uh, to answer your question if you have one. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start. Um, thank you for, for this excellent panel session and also Mark's um, earlier presentation. My name is Xavier Mwambwa. I work with the Open Society Foundation. And obviously, coming to the FDB proposal, we sort of support that 
and my question then is to, I think any one of you in the panel, all of you could uh, share a perspective because you are very deeply connected and work with African governments on this issue and other issues. Speaking about political will, which, if I'm not mistaken, seems to be the only stumbling block to this excellent technical proposal. And unfortunately, a lot of technical reform proposals need a political process to push them through. Who in Africa and what role can African governments themselves and African institutions like uh, UNSCA, African Union, play to garner political pressure so that it comes to bear on the different international players that are needed to come together and sort of push these proposals further. It's one thing asking others to have the political will, but I think if we don't get enough, the voice that Judy mentioned, in, if we don't get enough visibility, enough articulation from the African governments themselves mm -hmm. about how useful and how, how strategic this proposal could be for the short term, even though I agree with Jason that it's in the, at the end of the day, it's not going to change things trans in a transformational way, but it's actually an important sort of intermediary mm -hmm. uh, step in the short term. So what is the role for African institutions themselves in convincing the rest of the international players about this idea? Thank you, thank you. Um, any other questions? Yeah, let's take another one from the room. Um, hi, Sam Rick with AVAC. Um, apologies if this is like a dumb question, but I haven't done a lot of finance work because uh, the health space hasn't been super involved in that so far. But um, in what ways would the proposals in the Bridgetown Initiative facilitate the proposals that you're talking about um, and free up space for possibly health spending, but other spending as well? Great question, great question. Um, yes, go ahead and then we'll see if there's any online, then we'll, we'll Take these three and then we'll go we'll to online, online if there's any online questions. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm <coughs> Barry Herman, Social Justice and Global Development. Um, I want to ask the, uh, the parallel or the uh, counter question to the first one, which is earlier Mark Plant said the UK was interested, um, maybe uh, France, maybe China, they've made you know, um, proposals, well, the UK has also cut back ODA, and uh, is this a cheap way for them to um, give ODA? Um, what's going on, and where are the pressure points that might be effective um, in getting the deal done? Thank you. Okay, um, who would like to go first in answering any of these questions? I think that's uh, everyone on the panel. Um, well, Mavis, you, you want to go first? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, so first, here in the, the um, I don't know, maybe maybe there's another panelist who knows if there is, a, outside of the AF AFDB, if there's a continental push for this, where every African finance minister, this is an ask, right, for, for the AFDB, to, for, for, for us to do this. So I don't know, I think the AFDB itself has been pushing and civil society has been pushing along with the AFDB. What I haven't heard are African finance ministers pushing this themselves. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's, that's, that's a change that needs to happen. Is that a recommendation to AFDB? That, that definitely. <laughs> that, that, but the second thing is that this is an incredible time for Africa, right? Um, because of the great power competition, what are we seeing over this year? Five cabinet level visits from the US government into Africa. Mm -hmm. President Biden is expected to go to Africa this year, and there's still a couple more that will come. Below there, there have been a total of 18 high-level visits to the continent this year. There was the, and, and <laughs> after all of these visits, there has to be some sort of substantive outcome. This is an opportunity for the United States to use its immense political capital to get, I have a list, Canada, uh, what well, the UK already said they would, Maybe not China, because they're not on speaking terms. Um, but Norway, because at least it's not affected by the ECB decision. Um, South Korea, Japan, that's five countries, 500 million. We have it for the African Development Bank. Maybe if the US Treasury, because the US cannot make a contribution today, if the US Treasury would be in the back pushing these allies to be able to do it, we have it for the African Development Bank. That's the way to do it. However, the way the US works, 
is um, influence peddling or lobbying. <laughs> and unless there is a push from the African side to be able to get this, at least to get the U.S. to act uh, in this manner, the, the disparate and, and scattered uh, advocacy that is happening is not enough to be able to get the kind of push we want. So maybe ECA can 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 um, take this too and say, look, here are countries that might be able. China is already ready, so mm -hmm. maybe we just need four more, uh, yeah. um, and and we'll be able to, to to do it. So, so there's a moment, there's an opportunity, yep. and AFDB others should grab this mm -hmm. opportunity and have that kind of the one voice, consistent voice, is That's what right. you're saying. That's yeah. right. Okay. Jason, um, well, maybe, think, also, maybe also talk about Bridgetown. Is Bridgetown an opportunity for that? Well, I was good, yeah, that's what, sort of what I was going to try and respond to. I mean, Bridgetown is changing. Um, I think uh, uh, what, what we thought it was last year uh, has radically changed as of, I think, two days, two or three days ago. Um, and so the, the ideas behind uh, the Bridgetown initiative uh, we'll need a bit more um, investigation, investigation and research, research to understand what exactly the opportunities uh, they present. Because in the latest iteration, uh, there is a lot more um, inclusion of leveraging private finance. There's a lot more inclusion of the role of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, you know, and, and so I think whether that's going to be a good thing in terms of creating space for investments uh, in, in health, and so on and so forth might be um, something worth looking, looking at. I think the, the biggest challenge with uh, some of the proposals in the, in the latest version of the Bridgetown Initiative is that um, there is a de-risking uh, proposal in there, and, and part of it is, is, to, is, is to address issues of, of uh, uh, public services like healthcare. And, and I think for civil society organizations, one of the biggest challenges there is that it creates distortions, it deepens inequalities, it, it affects access, right? Uh, when you have uh, the private sector being given the responsibility of providing that. So I think that I would err on the side of caution in terms of whether the Bridgetown Initiative is something that uh, could create the fiscal space for investment in, in, in those types of things. Mavis, your thoughts? Is this, uh, and perhaps on Bridgetown and also on kind of, is there a kind of, <laughs> Can SDRs, a sort of cynical view of SDRs, um, are they a way of getting out of commitments? Um, thank you, Hannah. I haven't been in the Bridgetown discussions in the last 48 hours, so I will leave um, it with Jason's um, <laughs> position. You could say yes, but the truth is just in the same way that we say the rest of the world, is you know the, the, the same way we say in Africa is navigating a very tight fiscal space. You could say you know the rest of the world is navigating the same. I think what we need to look at right now is that with the limited sources of finance available right now, how can we think out of the box and make those finances work? for development of the continent. Mm -hmm. um, and we could extend, expend a lot of energy pushing mm -hmm. for money that is never going to come. Mm -hmm. Or we could look at the sources available right now and say, how do we push for those sources to be more effective? So I really appreciate the concerns raised about the SDR being, being a short-term instrument. But if it goes through the MDBs, it no longer has to be a short-term instrument. We can think out of the box mm -hmm. on how we use that tool. And so I, I think we really need to be, you know, we, we just need to be honest on the way in the world we are navigating right now. And we can either choose to push for the impossible or take what is right ahead of us and make it work. Um, and I'd like to echo Judith's point around getting a really solid voice from Africa on two or three things that they are asking for over the next 12 to 18 months. And if we don't get them all singing from a single hymn sheet, we have a challenge ahead of us. Yeah. And on single hymn sheets, that's something that UNECA obviously has an opportunity to do. Um, do you think that's, is Bridgetown, for example, an, an important opportunity? Or are you thinking maybe more long term? 
even the next annual meetings and beyond that. What what are the key points that? Um, so, points? Um, okay, a couple of things. First, I'd like to respond to the earlier point regarding the voices and the asks of the African ministers. Actually, one of the asks that are um, already e elaborated in and expressed in a communique of our conference of ministers and resolutions is the ask for the rechanneling of SDR through MDBs. Mm. Mm. Right. So this has been already, yeah. like, you know, um, <laughs> the consensus on that has been re reached and voiced. Yeah. So, you know, this is uh, already kind of like, you know, an achievement that we have, mm. that there is this backing behind it. Also, the African Development Bank, um, you know, was invited to uh, the, high, the Africa High Level Working Group uh, on global financial architecture, which is composed of the African ministers of finance, development, and economic mm. planning, mm. Uh, and uh, along with other sister institutions, it, and I mean, it includes the uh, African Union, ABB, um, African Bank, World Bank, and IMF. And they presented the proposal to African ministers, and um, you know, there was support for it, and they were asking specifically what we are talking about now. What is it from us that is needed? Mm. You know, mm. who do we, you know, need to push? Who, what, how can we help? So there is that, you know, um, already interest and backing. Um, I think uh, probably what we need is to, um, you know, uh, um, mobilize more, advocate more, yes. mm. and I think definitely there is a role for, you know, CSOs and uh, think tanks to really help in that and amplify the African voice, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so that would be important. Uh, another thing is, I think, these African asks were there even before the Bridgetown mm -hmm. and have been elaborated. I think the Bridgetown uh, is aligned with many of the asks that have been voiced by Africa. Mm -hmm. But I think many of these things have been already like voiced well well before and articulated in you know number of, of uh, 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 whether resolutions or statements that were were made and yeah. um, I, I really agree with uh, Mavis on the need to be pragmatic meaning um, in the current environment there are many countries that are you know considering resources looking whether you know they can maintain the level of OTA or not or what to do I think uh, these resources of SDRs are already there. The cost of it relative to any other option is quite low. Yes, right. So we yes. need to really push for this to happen. Mm. Okay, they they don't need to eat from other resources that they need to do for to tackle like you know cost of living crisis or to tackle like you know other issues domestically that they have to deal with. So how can we really motivate them to take action uh, that will benefit everyone? For them, they would be still helping many of these countries that you know they were supposed to, yeah. at the same time without eating into the the resources that you know they need to tackle very sensitive domestic issues that they are facing. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely from the data and the evidence as you were talking about, the other regions haven't used their SDRs, mm, <laughs> so true. they're there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, exactly. So yeah, very 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 important point, very fair point as well, reminding us of what positions there are out there, which actually maybe. It's possible even to sort of bring that together to target specifically what's being discussed at Bridgeton and, and yeah, maybe that's something um, worth worth reviewing. Questions from online. Are there any any questions online? So I'll just mention two questions online. The first one is just addressing, okay, there seems to be um, inequalities in terms of economic size and voting power causing um, allocation and in inequalities. So this person asks, um, is there a way to include or a mechanism um, that we could include to also include need or human security as part of you know, conditions to get um, these SDR allocations? And what's the second question? Um, and the second part of that question is, um, if any at all, is has the IMF had a response to um, how limiting or unjust these um, 
the quotas are? Good questions. Um, mm -hmm. Can we also see, is there another question from the audience perhaps that we could add in? Anyone else have any questions or comments? Mark, you may even want to know. <laughs> Observing now. Um, any other questions from the audience? Okay, let's take, let's take those two questions. And again, it's kind of taking us to the long term, um, taking us to the long term, but also, yeah, what is the IMS response? And, uh, uh, and how, can, how, can, how can we move to this, to a different type of allocation mechanism, quota mechanism? Hannah, you had some very specific ideas on that. Mm -hmm. um, is that also something that African governments are looking at and and is for example is there an opportunity is UNECA already doing it or is there an opportunity for UNECA to do some more work on that to explain that option mm -hmm. sure so actually this week earlier this week on Monday we um, had a meeting of that uh, Africa high level working group on global financial architecture and one of uh, the the topic that we discussed were the, it was the reform reforms required for the IMF to be, you know, fit, better fit for the 21st century and to better respond to African needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, a key component of that was actually the IMF quota reform. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that had been discussed with the African ministers if, earlier this week and was one of the things that like will be voiced during the meetings on the need I mean, to, to reform the formula, you know, reduce the um, you know, weight of indicator for openness, for reserves, because basically how it's done now, uh, countries that are like you know, um, current account surplus countries uh, are basically more advantaged. Mm -hmm. so, so if you have you know, structural imbalances that you're keeping through demand policies, this actually gives you more quota and more, uh, you know, later SDR allocation. So basically, the current system gives more, like additional quota to those that already have. So we need to introduce that element about exposure and vulnerability to that formula, so that countries, you know, can we can have more voice to these you know, low income and developing countries and for African countries to right. have higher voice. So that actually is the right moment to start these discussions because the cycle for quota reform starting now at the IMF was this year and decisions at the IMF are at the end decisions of shareholders, okay, of membership. I mean, that's at the end. Uh, uh, and we need like, you know, to amplify that African voice to basically change that system to be more uh, equitable. Mm. Um, and it starts with this discussion, it starts with voicing it both at the IMF board and then at the IMF uh, board of governors meetings to really you know, uh, make that point, especially that we are you know, one of the largest uh, in terms of clients, you know, users of IMF tools. So, uh, you know, as the kind of shareholders that are utilizing these tools the most and actually contributing mm. to, uh, you know, the operating cost of the IMF, we need to have higher voices in yeah. the process. Yeah. And quite often, I think the reform discussion is often dominated by the geopolit geopolitics in terms of, is it what China wants some reform or is it what the US wants some reform? But actually what you're saying is that there is an African perspective on reform and that African perspective is ready to be articulated and listened to, um, but maybe there's also a role to kind of actually really push that that specific position and make sure um, make sure that it's well well understood um, globally, right? Absolutely. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, now we've got a few minutes to wrap up. Um, our last last opportunity for some further questions. Um, otherwise, I will take the chair's prerogative. Mavis, did you did you have any anything that you wanted to add to that point about uh, reform? Mm 
No, I, I agree with um, Hanan on the points around getting a stronger African voice out there. I think the challenge we have right now is that if you look at the ECA communique, the African position was very clear. Yep. When you listen to our ministers, you don't necessarily have those points being Absolutely. articulated yeah. in the same way. So the yeah. question is, how do we all work together to help push an advocacy agenda and support our leaders to articulate these key points at every single point. And it's yep. not, this is not just a UNECA issue. Mm -hmm. It's something that, you know, ASSET and other policy institutes, AfroDAD and other NGOs, we all have a role to play in helping that common message get out. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Excellent. So common messaging. Yep. Um, so let's let's finish on that kind of what what would be that one key common message you think needs to come out on SDRs today? What what African ministers should be saying? SDRs, Hannah. Meet commitments, rechannel through MDBs. That would be my one one. And maybe AFDB specifically. Right now. <laughs> of course, of course. I mean, we may as well take it to AFDB. Look, like Mark yeah. recommended it. So. No, ab no, absolutely, because this yeah. is the existing, yeah. the existing yeah. proposal. Yeah. Okay, Jason. I think more SDRs, uh, quarter reform, and uh, additionality. Great, excellent. Mine, Good. mine would be uh, AFDB. You know, like conservatives in in government. One of the reasons they resist any change at all is because they're afraid of a slippery slope. They're afraid, like, if we give an inch here, it will become so. Let the AFDB be our slippery slope. AFDB, and, and once that happens and it works, then we can begin to apply it to other, um, maybe regional MDBs, and, and, and so AFDB, AFDB, AFDB. Okay, excellent. Very clear. Uh, Mavis, I'm going to give you the last word before I take the last word as moderator. Um, Mavis, what's your one thing? Selfishly, selfishly, rechannel through AFDB okay. as the pilot for MDB um, receiving SDRs. Yep. Great. Okay. We have a chorus. <laughs> we have a chorus right here. Fantastic. Okay. On that note, um, I would like to say thank you to everyone uh, involved in organizing this event. Thank you to pa our panelists. Thank you to uh, uh, Mark for uh, opening for us so eloquently and uh, and thank you to everyone who joined us here in the room and online and to the teams who worked um, behind the scenes mm -hmm. to make this happen. Yeah. I will plug a couple of things from Development Reimagined because that's what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> and in particular, we have a paper coming out uh, very soon. Uh, we actually did a preview of the paper a couple of, uh, I think it was a week ago actually, uh, with at a conference on um, with uh, our partners uh, FDL uh, about options for China to rechannel um, its its SDRs meet that commitment, as you were saying, Hannah. How can it meet that commitment? Um, so hopefully uh, others can also use that uh, that options paper. AFDB is featured as one of the options, um, and do so. Do have a look at that, uh, and also we have an infographic which sets out some of the statistics that we talked about um, today. In addition to mm. in addition to Marks. Uh, in a kind of very uh, digestible way. I think there was a QR code around elsewhere, but you can just look at our website on that. Um, but thank you again. Thank you very much, everyone, um, for your great uh, insights and all the work that you all do um, on behalf of the continent and to support the continent. Um, thank you, everybody. <laughs>